almost, I almost. And the temple, where is it? Oh, it's yet to be built, me boy. Oh, that's why we're here. Mom would love it here, Dad. She does love it. Let's run to the top of the hill. Oh, no, you don't. Wait for me. Hello there. <laughs> My name is Arthur. Arthur Ashton. And we are just off of the boat. And I wondered when I'd be bumping into you. I know you. I know you. Linda Newter! <laughs> I knew your great grandmother. She was with us at the docks at Liverpool. She'll be coming after. Oh, and I, I know you back there. Sue St. Marie. I knew your great grandmother! <laughs> You're practically family. You know that, don't you? No? Well, you will! because we have come to talk about that. Your story, and mine. It's the story of planting the seed of truth and letting the light of God's love bring forth the fruit. That's what happened to me. In 1837, my daughter Sarah. Father. Ah, over here, love. She came home on fire talking nonsense about a prophet in America. Nonsense, eh? I believe you were looking <laughs> oh, for this father. I was indeed. Thank you, love. But then again, friends, if you do some real searching, you'll discover that what you once called nonsense is really the truth. And the truth can change you. The search for truth in my family began with my great-grandfather, who left his posterity this. I think you'll find it interesting. In the year of our Lord, 1745, I, William Ashton, in the county of Lancashire, being of sound mind, do make this my last My last will and testament. There is a spiritual unrest in the land. Beliefs are springing up and being heard. We believe with others man should be free to worship his maker in a manner pleasing to himself. It's a true document, friends, found in a parish register in Lancaster. There are hundreds like this all over our fair land. <clears throat> the freedom that William and others were seeking. To learn of God, to worship him, to even know if he exists, is something our people have been searching for have hungered for, for generations. Oh, it's part of what makes us who we are. However, for centuries, our people had no way to learn of God's plan for them, for the scriptures in English were outlawed, and without God's word, we were in darkness. Back in the 14th century, that was John Wycliffe's concern. Look, you call me a heretic because I have translated the Bible into the common tongue of the people? And a century later, Anne Askew was burned at the stake for defending that same cause. I had rather to read five lines in the Bible in English than to hear five sermons in a language I do not understand. Do we remember that those found teaching or simply reading from the Bible in English were persecuted, like these parents from Coventry? You have knowingly taught the Lord's Prayer to your children in English and are condemned to die. Burn them with their cherished Bibles! Burned at the stake in 1519 for teaching their children the truth. And of course, there was William Tyndale from Gloucestershire. If God spare my life, how many years hence, I will cause a boy that driveth a plough to know more of the scriptures than thou! Tyndale believed that everyone is intended to know God personally, and he gave his all to translate the Bible into English. And by all, I mean gave his life, offering these final words as he was bound to the stake. Oh Lord, open the King of England's eyes! That was not the end 
Another reformer, Hugh Latimer, said as the torch was laid at his feet. We shall this day light such a candle in England as I trust shall never be put out. And they, and so many others like them, were right, and their prayers were answered. Three years after Tyndale's death, the great Bible was approved, making the word of God available in English for everyone to read. Let there be asked, and it shall be given. Oh, See, through Tyndale, we, shall find. we became a people of the book. And as the darkness began to lift, words of truth illuminated our lands. <laughs> we could read what Christ's church should be like and began to ask questions. Like John Lathrop here in the 17th century. Who today has the authority to baptize and act in God's name as Christ's early followers did? Such authority, I fear, has been lost and will not be restored until new apostles are called by Christ, who is the head of his church. Unlike Peter and John of old, new apostles were called. Christ's church was restored, just as the Bible foretold. And the Lord sent one of his apostles to England. <laughs> it was 1837, when these two missionaries stepped off the ship in Liverpool and were led to Preston. And brother, feel it. this. Seems like a goodly place and people. Agreed, other people. It was election time in these fair towns, and a politician just happened to unfurl his party slogan at the moment they arrived. What a sight! We seem to have come upon a political rally, under Kimball. Therefore, let the very watchword of our lives serve as the motto of our party. Truth will prevail! Amen! So let it be! We begin, then, with these two missionaries. <laughs>